Hi folks, I'm Alan Watt and this is Cutting Through the Matrix on the 28th of August 2016. It's pouring once again this weekend in Ontario, Canada, and last weekend I think it was the same. Uh, monsoon time, of course, this is what you give you nowadays. Monsoon, since they give you the aerial spraying, and of course, uh, uh, since they're claiming, of course, that um, there's just too many people talking about the chemtrails and the, the, the geoengineering that's going on. Oh, it doesn't really happen, apparently. Experts say, you know, experts say, I mentioned that last week too, I think. Experts say, it, that, oh no, it's only water vapor. And that's why, of course, NASA had to do a videos and even educational things for children at school to make sure children at school get brainwashed awfully early because they're going to see more and more and more of this. You know what they should do with these so-called uh, just um, condensation trails is, is take them all away from Canada and places like that and, and go over the deserts and, and the Middle East and so on and, and turn up, make it all blossom and bloom. It'll cut down on the, on the sun getting through as well. And uh, you get global dimming, that's what this climate causes, global dimming, NASA admits that too. And because of the rain with all that condensation, condensation trails, you see. Uh, well, that water can help it to bloom in the deserts. There you go. This is a, uh, this is a, of course, I don't think they'll try that, will they? No. Because they're a big engineering job to do all across the Western countries, more so than anywhere else, it seems. And I tell you, this part of Ontario is, is, is a favourite place for testing a lot of things out on. Uh, it, really, it truly is. But anyway, I, I don't go into the, the usual nonsense they are told are your topics for the week, you see. And if when I do touch them, it's not in the way they want you to touch them. Because really, that's as I said last week, that's what they want you to do. Here's your topics for the week. And politics is, a, is literally a sideshow. It's, it's a circus now for, for the public. The public especially has been so oh, glutted for their whole lives with dramas and soaps and fiction and movies and so on. They give you literally stuff that's right of the poorest, poorest quality, um, soap operas or something. Because there's no substance at all in any of it, except he said, she said, and, and name-calling and stuff like that. It's drama for the public to believe in. Because really, you see, with all the myriad of uh, this pyramid of institutions and NGOs and all the rest of it, and, and foundations, uh, and all the specialized groups that are all created all by the one group at the very, very top, by the way. I always remember that. Uh, that uh, uh, because they run the world, the the, the 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 capstone is a gold capstone. That's what's missing, you see. And those who own that's a symbol of it. Those who own it own the entire pyramid and the whole system underneath it. I hope you understand that. Your voting doesn't matter for that part of it at all, not at all. And you've got all these, as I say, this, all these bricks and institutions all the way down the pyramid running your lives and planning the future, always planning the future, because the boys at the top, the real masters, own the entire system. And, and they, they always plan the future to make sure that, that they've got total, total, complete control right down to uh, what your brain will even be conditioned with from birth into the next generation, and the next, the next, next, etc, uh, etc. Et That's how bad it is today. It really is. There's nothing out there that's safe anymore. Just basically safe. Like here's, a, here's a simple, straight thing, a fact. Uh, there's always a spin on it to get you to, to, to see something in a different light or whatever. Uh, to do with some policy or plan or sustainability or greening or, or whatever it happens to be, you see. This, this is nothing safe anymore. Every, everything is totally politicized. And that's the only time I use it, but the term politics is politicized. That means that's what the polity, the people, the, you at the bottom, the proletariat, are supposed to know and think. That's what it means, you see. That's what it means. So here you are, and you've got uh, this, this big soap opera, as I say, going on. Uh, where one candidate is claiming that, that, that the guy who's running in the U.S. Uh, has got a hair transplant, uh, yada, 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 and all that nonsense. 
and and supposedly his supporters are, are, are yelling that, this, that the woman who's running against him can't even stand up straight. So, I mean, it's all a joke, folks. It's, <laughs> well, oh, it's the most sorriest, sorriest drama in script writing uh, for the lowest level of public they've ever, ever shown the public, in fact. That's true, isn't it? Come on, come on. And all media is getting big handouts to keep all this nonsense going including, you know, the new institutionalized, authorized alternate medias as well. And they are. Of course they are. Because everybody's after your brain. Do you understand that everybody wants a bit of your mind? Or even all of your mind, some of them? Don't they? Don't they? And, and it's astonishing the lens they go to to try and grab it. But never give your brain away to anybody. Anybody at all. Don't understand the whole purpose of your life is to go through life and you must claim your brain. You. Because by the time you understand anything at all, that there's bits of it already sullied and dirtied by other, other movements, etc., that, that wanted a bit of it, you've got to clean it all up and, and figure out who you are, you see, and, and what you think about things. Uh, don't just swallow a line on anything, hook, line, and sinker. Uh, you, you can take a little bit out the worm here and there, if, it's, if that's the bait, but then you can spit out again too. Take what's true, etc., and take the spin out of it, because everybody's after you in, in some movement or another, you see. Or to get you to, to give your authority to them, or whatever it happens to be. That's where voting is. But uh, tonight I'm just going to go through some of the things to show you uh, and you'll never hear any any politician saying I'm going to end any of these or these organisations, these movements, and so on, these international movements because they're all international. Remember that um, everything you're hearing now, even to do with sexuality, is just a continuation of, of the of the the communist movement. For those who don't know that, the Marxist movement, the Trotskyite movement, it's, it's a continuation of it. As they, as they always yell about freeing and freedom and freedom, they take freedom away. Always, always. Don't ever forget that, folks. And don't ever forget what the Soviet Union was. Because under the guise of everyone's going to be equal and all this utopia, millions and millions right to his bitter end were slaughtered. Slaughtered. To get them out of the way. Anybody who had a thought of their own, they were slaughtered. Some of them say up to 80 million during its whole existence were slaughtered. Firing squads, uh, garroted, all kinds of things to just kill them. Because you see, those who, who, who always push for your rights into particular odd things that would destroy the structure of society down to its fundamental roots are completely intolerant folks once they're in power. Completely intolerant. Always, if you forget that, you're done for. And again, again, it is your choice to forget it, I suppose. But anyway, I'll tell you what, I'll touch on some of the organizations that are after your brain, of course. And and to show you how things work. I'll, I'll just show you, I always like to show you how things really work, you see. Nothing's as ever appears to be on the surface. Or as it's presented to you in, in very shallow documentaries or shallow write-ups, etc. See, everything's got a spin on it. But you understand that everything is to destroy any kind of tradition, any kind of tradition, or what used to be called normalcy in, in whole bunches of areas, uh, it has to be destroyed to bring in the new. The new is dysfunctional, where no people can stand together and say, we are a people, for instance, and, and, uh, and even save themselves. You must be totally destroyed. And once you, that's happened, you have no power, then you're dysfunctional and you're helpless, actually. Helpless. By design. I mean, the old cultures they had, yeah, they had lots of faults in them. Lots of faults. But at least people knew who they were. What they were and everyone else. There was no, there was no great debates on, on stuff that was just nonsensical to them. They didn't have to get taught anything in school to make them change their mind on something. This seemed basically straightforward to them. 
And school today is nothing but social engineering. That's all. It's about on behalf of the masters and what they want the next bunch to, to be brainwashed and into believing with their Pavlovian responses and their guilt complex and everything else. They, they ram down their throats, you see. But here's an article here from someone who obviously makes his living on this kind of stuff. And uh, it's, it's about the United Nations. It's not from the United Nations, nations as far as I know, but it's about the United Nations. Someone who obviously gets their money on, on this kind of thing and gets foundation money or something. But um, it says, For the first time, the LGBT rights will be formally institutionalized into the human rights mechanisms of the United Nations. So, formally institutionalized into the human rights mechanisms. That means that's on the top of the list of demands that you must push before you help anybody across the planet. You see? And all the money in the State Department in the U.S. is already doing it for a few years now. And other countries too. Well, you can't, we can't give you any help at all, any financial help or anything, until you put this at the top of the list here. So now you're telling every other nation how their cultures must alter totally. Is, is that tolerant? Huh? Is it? No, of course it's not. Do you understand that this particular site with this headline I'll put up, uh, you can look it up yourself and so on, and you'll find that uh, this character that runs it, it seems to be his name, it's everywhere, uh, is obviously meaning he's living on this and uh, he knows what he's, he's doing, he knows what he's there for. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, but there's the terminology, think about the terminology, institutionalized. You understand it's already institutionalized into the schooling system. And when things are institutionalized, are for our brainwashing uh, the techniques really that are used to make sure it's stuck there and it can't be overlooked. It's not something you can believe or not believe. It's something that must be indoctrinated into, institutionalized, understand that. So, so much for freedom and all the prattle about freedom, when they don't leave you alone to have a mind that's free on your own. That would never do, would it? Now also, this one here, to show you that all your voting means nothing again. Well, UNCTAD, UNCTAD, United Nations, you see. It says, reaches out to academic economists. So economists, you see. And they signed an agreement with the University of Geneva this month. And uh, they can help the world to meet the ambitious sustainable development goals. So here's another NGO group made up of academic uh, economists, you know, pen pushers and guys who add them, some and all, and, and con and diddle books and so on. Uh, they've got a group together to help meet ambitious sustainable development goals They're totally again politicized in that this is what the polity the people are going to do what's going to be rammed upon the people at the bottom the proletariat you see you know them huh, them that's what they really mean by it and um so that by getting more involved in the practicalities of making policy participants said in the panel discussion on the sidelines of the annual Congress of the European Economic Association, uh, Europe's largest meeting of economists. And it says, in the moderating the panel discussion during the, its largest meeting of economists, UNCTAD, Deputy Secretary General, a lot of Deputy Secretary Generals, don't they? Joachim Reiter says the SDGs can be achieved only if the world's 48 least developed countries can grow faster in the next decade than China has done in the last 15 years. So, it was not up to the countries themselves at one time, hmm? wasn't it? Uh, where did we suddenly lose this whole idea of the global system being run by outsiders? You see, it's been run by outsiders for an awful long time. And then they go into a backdrop of, and again, it's all done under the guise is going to help them. It's to help everybody by forbidding you to say things, do things, or anything else, you see. A backdrop of weak global trade notwithstanding, middle-income countries will also have to boost their economies, while the cost of the SDGs uh, has been put at $2.5 trillion. Right? So, 
Emphasise the importance of bridging the gap between academics and policymakers, Mr. Reiter earlier signed an agreement with University of Geneva Rector Eve uh, Fukiger to show UNCTAD's commitment to building ties. Here's that building ties again between the thinkers and policymakers. In other words, what they do, just like the, the CFR, that's which their job is, is to make policy advise policy for politicians. Not you, you know, the people who think you elect them, but uh, but you see, that there's all these organisations there to write the policies out for the politicians. So who runs what? Come on. Come on, folks. Huh? Who pays all these characters? Who sets them up? Who's the big foundations and so on that, that sponsor, create all these things, pay for it all to get them up and running? The memorandum of understanding between the two organizations will enhance interdisciplinary research and promote policymakers and practitioners' engagement in supporting the development agenda. There you go. What does your vote have to do with any of this stuff that affects you folks, since you're going to pay for it all, you see? You're going to pay for all this stuff. That's what it means. This is all it's about. Middle income countries can, can pay for all this. Oh, that's awfully nice. Do you get a chance to vote on that? No. And it says here, the panel featured former World Bank chief economist, well, naturally, because, you see, the Royal Institute for International Affairs, uh, which owns as well as broad organization, Council of Foreign Relations, also owns the IMF and the World Bank and the BIS, Bank for International Settlements. Just coincidence, of course. Eh? Anyway, the World Bank chief economist and emeritus chair of the Paris School of Economics, Francois uh, Bourguignon, former director of the United Nations University World Institute for Development Economics Research. Isn't that a mouthful, eh? I mean, this is so communistic, too, and, and bureaucratic, isn't it? United Nations University World Institute for Development Economics Research. And that's, that's called UNU hyphen wider for, for short. Uno wider. Uno wider. <laughs> Where's the dictionary for this one? Anthony Shorrocks and Eliana La Ferrara, research dean at the uh, you know, Zenza uh, Gasparini Institute for Economic Research of Bocconi uh, University in Milan, Italy. And so there you are. Again, get all the universities involved in all this, though it's, though it's some kind of official thing. Universities are not supposed to be there, folks, to make policies for nations and other nations too, for that matter. But of course, they've always used them for that, and the communists were famous for using it for that for an awful long time too. Hadn't stopped, of course. Marxists, communists, blah 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 blah, a front for another group, of course. And this is the the, uh, the panel was a side event to the Congress and a parallel meeting of the Eco. Listen, to this one. Econometric Society, or oh, Econometric Society, which brought together more than one and a half thousand academic economists in Geneva, Switzerland, from 22nd to 26th of August. For UNCTAD, oh, this event was very important for continuing exercise in the bridging the gap between theory and practice, Mr. Reiter said. Well, do you vote for UNCTAD and these one and a half thousands of, of academic economists and so on? Do you? No. Of course you don't. Why are they making policy that's going to affect and rule over you? And why are your governments all obeying these characters? Huh? Uh, shouldn't that be on the line too when you vote for anything at all? Shouldn't you get the vote that they do in Switzerland for everything that's going to affect the ordinary citizen? Shouldn't you? Everything. <laughs> of course you should. Are you ever going to get that? No, no, no way, folks. No. You see, you don't have freedom, and you never have had freedom. In a little bit of, of, of things you had, uh, a kind of a great area of freedom in, for yourself has been taken away from you all the time, under the guise of freedom for others. It's quite interesting, isn't it? You really understand it. And then, shedding light on sustainable water. Oh, there you go. And um, water and chemicals, of course. Uh, and this this write-up, uh, I think I've mentioned quite, uh, quite some time ago, but um, it says water and chemicals are two words that don't seem to mix. However, water is of fundamental importance in the chemical industry. Uses a coolant solvent and cleaning agent, water is a building block of many products. And then they go on to the, the BASF. To address this concern, BASF develops innovative solutions to reduce uh, pollution, 
use their resource more efficiently and purify contaminated water supplies. So it's really about a big promotion again uh, to for the big private corporations. They always use your tax money for, to get research and development done, again, by universities and so on, for free for them. Uh, and uh, most most multi-billionaires make their money off uh, big handouts. You understand what they do? They do, they really do. <laughs> off your money, you know. So the BSF donated $1 million to the Louisiana State University College of Engineering to, to create a state-of-the-art space called the BASF Sustainable Living Laboratory set to open this fall. It will promote problem-based teaching and resource focused on sustainable solutions to global challenges. And they want to go into solar-driven water purification uh, using the, the old system of ultraviolet light and so on, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's another corporation that's going to get all uh, the benefit done for them for free. And your government is kicking in the money too, or your tax money, etc., etc., etc. This is in line with the United Nations Sustainability Goals and Commitment to Quality Education. I mean, what is the United Nations, folks? You ever ask that question? It's not a nation. It's not a country. Yeah, it's got all these sovereign rights and so on, but it's not a country. What is it? Do you vote for the United Nations? Do you know anybody who gets to vote for the United Nations? No, you don't. But they're making all these sustainability goals, supposedly, and all the hundreds and hundreds of NGOs underneath them and in concert with the big foundations that finance the NGOs. They're making it all, enforcing it all on you. Do you vote for it? No, you don't. So what's all this nonsense about, yeah, I've got the right to vote? <laughs> well, good for you. <laughs> It's, I like I like jokes. So I mean, this this is the stuff you get fed, as I say, and 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 here you are. It's such nonsense, isn't it? But this is how things really work. As I say, the big corporations, all of them now, all of them get massive handouts from the public. Have done for a long time, actually. Certainly, and um, so they're also going to, uh, with a broader support or community by investing in students and preparing them for career opportunities in science, technology, engineering, and math through outreach uh, to local elementary and high schools. But by the way, and I won't mention it here, yet they also will have the same institutionalized sustainability of things indoctrinated in the children, you see, for the whole policy to continue. And then it says, academic collaboration strengthens the power of innovation. This is a PR marketing article, right? Allowing us to present cutting-edge solutions to our customers. Well, why don't you pay for all yourself? Huh? Why don't you? Etc., etc. Uh, through financial support for research, mentoring, professional development, and collaboration on innovative and exciting new projects. Well, as for those who break the cash in, BASF works with its partners to strategically solve today's challenging problems and ensure a better tomorrow, it says here. There you go. Isn't that nice? Better tomorrow. All these nice little little phrases and stuff like that. Partners. Isn't that nice? And strategically solve, solve challenges. Oh, that's good too. And a better tomorrow. I like utopias, don't you? They're awfully expensive, though, aren't they? Hmm. But this is the kind of stuff you're constantly fed, and we think nothing of it, because we've seen it since we're, we could think and read, or, or, or even understand what words were. We've, we've, we've been indoctrinated with all this stuff. Now, Greenpeace report calls on none of it to shun resource development, so they're going to have none of it, you see, in favour of sustainable projects, because none of it's a place. Canada's Arctic territory of none of it has an unprecedented opportunity for demonstrating to the world what sustainable development looks like in the post-fossil fuel era. Well, I don't know what it'll look like. It'll be absolutely quiet. Everybody's dead, frozen stiff, gone. You see? That's what it'll look like. It says a new report commissioned by Greenpeace. The report's from another one. I mean, you understand some of these organizations have levels of bureaucrats equivalent to some nations. Do you understand that? And some big corporations have the same, of course, and the big foundations too. They've got hundreds, sometimes thousands of bureaucrats working for them, all directing the future that you're going to live in, enslaving, which they've designed for you. But you won't mind it because they've already brainwashed you through what you've been taught in school. So the report's entitled Beyond Fossil Fuels, Sustainable Economic Development Opportunities in Eastern None of It, 
was developed by the Centre for Sustainable Economy, says John Talberth, the Centre's President and Chief Economist. Governments tend to fall for false promises of big corporate-led economic development solutions such as mines and oil and gas, Talber said. The leading author of the report told Radio Canada International in a phone interview from Oregon, U.S. In the attempt to overlook developing smaller portfolios of sustainable projects that are targeted directly at improving livelihoods for those the least well-off. Well, the least well-off, you see, won't be working won't be working in developing the post-fossil fuel sciences uh, that all these, uh, these uh, uh, what can you say about these characters, they're like, they're like vultures. They, they always get rich and feed off all the cons that they build through generations. That's what they're like, folks. Really, that's what they are, isn't it? Uh, what a complete, everything you read now is, is total brainwashing public relations marketing, isn't it? Then they lay out the Sustainable Development Goals and the report makes the, the case that the small case Sustainable Development uh, Solutions to, uh, hold great promise while building the economy in none of it based on resource extraction is more of a curse than a blessing. Having, as true, having, as a true, isn't it? Having to go to work and having work to go to is more of a curse than a blessing, isn't it? I guess after this you have no work, at, well, you won't be there. Eventually. And I hate the terms they use too, you see, right from the, the top of the pyramid, who see you as a different species. Uh, some of these key sustainable development uh, sectors include human capital, that's you, renewable energy, culturally sensitive indigenous tourism, or <laughs> tourism, <laughs> you're surviving tourism, and global leadership and sustainable fisheries management, Talber said. Human capital, to me that's just a disgusting term, it really is. It really is, isn't it? It really is, isn't it? But aren't you disgusted? And then they get you to use the same terminology. Huh? And of course, all the trendies pick it up and, oh, you know, and, and, and they start using it in their conversation. Oh, human capital. Uh, why not call folks slaves, you know? Lower classes, peasants, you know, and all that kind of stuff. The stuff that you used to use all, all the time. Why don't you do? Why don't you do that, yeah? Or live in a more hygienic society now. We don't use these terms. We've got better ones like human capital. <laughs> uh, the federal and territorial governments also have to call international attention to the incredible value of a traditional ecological knowledge and the role of this traditional knowledge in sustaining livelihoods and to make sure that this knowledge is passed on to coming generations, he said. Really? Hmm. I'll put this, this article up for you too To show you everything is such Go through the marketers to make sure Everything's properly said And it's all politically correct And won't offend anybody Even when they are offending you Even, even the people they're talking about uh, I'm sure are offended hopefully Because they should be By what they're being told here Is when other people, outsiders Are going to make uh, are, are designing their future for them Huh? Hmm? Tourists. That's that's what the that's what the Royal Chief for International Affairs, Dash CFR, talked about turning Scotland into a long, long time ago. And when they said that, I thought at the time, well, you, know, that's what we said at the side of the road selling beads to tourists. You know, that's that's where we're going to end up. Not kidding you. Not kidding you. And it's all decided by outsiders. All of it, always. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, here's another one. Climate change name, one of the biggest threats to America's national parks. See, these are all topics you're supposed to sit and oh, fret about. No, no. This, they're all cons. They want money, etc., etc., you see. Always the same. Uh, climate change and staying relevant. So there, there you go. Climate change, two, two words, and staying relevant, another two words. Two of the biggest challenges for the National Park Service. That's all for marketing, you see as it celebrates its centennial this month. So they always make up new threats for the centennials and stuff. So climate change is one of our very large threats, says Mike Reynolds, Deputy Director of the NPS Operations. NPS Operations, is this a war thing or something? 
we have a very large uh, science team working on that with partners in the science community. So we're very concerned about how to deal with species at risk. For example, landscapes and maintaining places. Even historic areas, we have certain weathering that goes on now. Even the monuments here in Washington that we're studying. They're studying monuments, that's awfully important. So climate change staying relevant to the constituents, to the American people, making sure we tell the stories, the full diverse story of the American experience. It says these would be a couple of things I would worry about. He said in the next hundred years, some of the nation's 4 in 13 parklands may look different than they do now because of a warming climate. Well, guess some. They've always looked different every, every, every 100 or 200 or 300 years, always. Because the climate's never been uh, like static in your home for those who can afford it, you know, the, the climate uh, control, etc. Like in their home. Most folk can, of course, but there are those that can. And it's always constant. See, the world does not like that outside. It's always changing. And you always read of different centuries that are colder than other ones or warmer than other ones. And that's, that's what happens all the way back to the pre dinosaur thing, you see. Before man was around, it was still happening then too. So it says, we may have in, in Glacier National Park fewer glaciers. Well, you understand, in between, in between ice ages, uh, the glaciers not melt until you get another ice age. Uh, so that's normal. Anyway, it says, we're trying to figure out how to uh, change that process, mitigate those processes. Well, maybe, maybe they should just get more big uh, solar power uh, things in to, to create more electricity and, and run, you know, freezing wires through all the ice there and, and just keep them going and, and, and then get the tax pretty fund that as well. Isn't that our birthright to pay for everything? Yeah. Isn't it? But we may have to tell stories and we may have to understand and show parks a different way ahead. I hope not. More immediate threat to the nation's parks is a large and growing deferred maintenance backlog, which stood at $11.927 billion at the end of the fiscal 2015. Well, they keep creating new parks. So have you noticed that? All the countries are doing the same. They're always sneaking in. Every, every government sneaks, sneaks, in, sneaks in reports every year of how many par new parks they're creating that you can't go into anymore. So for several years, NPS's maintenance funding has not kept pace with its identified needs, it says on its website. That deferred maintenance total is expected to rise again in the fiscal year 2016, even though Congress gave NPS $90 million in the centennial year to address deferred maintenance needs, as well as an additional $28 million for transportation repairs and construction. Huh, an additional $28 million for transportation repairs? And construction. While these increases will enable the NPS to address more than as critical like requirements, the DM deferred maintenance. <laughs> I love this. No wonder you end up have to you have to become a robot eventually to, to learn all this nonsense. And I'm not kidding you. Total will continue to, to grow, the Park Service said. On Tuesday, just in time for the National Park Service's 100th birthday, August 25th, President Obama, by proclamation, established the uh, Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument in North Central Maine. Isn't that nice? Eh? The proclamation says the 87,500 acres an enormous area is an extraordinary natural and cultural landscape with mountains, woods and waters that are still cherished by Native Americans, logged by lumberjacks and enjoyed by artists, authors, scientists, conservationists, <laughs> re re recreationalists and others who have drawn knowledge and inspiration from this landscape. Hmm, I see. 87,500 acres. Hmm. So there you go. And this goes on and on and on and on. But why should you give more and more money? Uh, remember, this is just for your own country. And one little part of your own country in the U.S. Well, you know, you with being middle income and all that, will have to pay a lot more for the other things I've just read before that and spread it across the world, you see. Because it's your, it's, your, it's your native birthright as Americans to, to pay for the rest of the planet, etc., etc. A new report rated countries on sustainable development and the U.S. did horribly. This, this is, of course, a really honest article, isn't it? Of course it is. But they brainwash you and give you lies and, and put through marketing companies to really make you feel guilty. No, they wouldn't do that, would they? Would they? 
So the US did horribly. Aren't you feel, don't you feel, didn't you blush when I said that? The US did horribly. Pope Francis addresses attendees in the opening ceremony to commence a plenary meeting of the United Nations Sustainable Development Summit 2015 at the UN headquarters in Manhattan, New York, September 25th, 2015. And it shows you that nice picture and all that. The UN Sustainable Development Summit. So it's to get that in your head in the newspaper article along with, with all the rest of it here. It says the United Nations and its 193 member states embraced the most sweeping quest yet to basically save the world. Oh my God. What movie is this? Did I miss this movie? Uh, and everyone in it dubbed the Sustainable Development Goals. It's a global agenda. Well, who, 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 who voted for this agenda? I mean, why shouldn't those who pay for it all have to get a chance to vote on it all? Oh, we can't have that. We? Global agenda to fix climate change. To fix climate change. Well, you can't fix something that, that's natural and, and is not meant to be changed. Back and forth, back and forth, up and down, up and down. But it's also to stop hunger. It's amazing how everything just jumps on the bandwagon. And end poverty, you see. Extend health, as they cut it back in your own country, and access to jobs, as you hardly have left because it's all been exported from your factories into China. And vastly more, all by 2030. Do you understand? This is all part of sustainable development goals. Huh? That you're going to pay for the whole planet here. And give more jobs across the planet too. And the sustainable development goals. Hmm. Did you get to vote on that too? No, I don't think you did. you? No, I don't think you did. Eh? The goals comprise no less than 17 separate items and 169 targets within them. And this isn't just an airy exercise. The targets are quite specific. By 2030, uh, progressively achieve and sustain income growth of the bottom 40% of the population at a, a rate higher than the national average. That means that at least in many cases, countries can actually be measured on how they're faring in meeting these goals based on a large range of sociological, economic and other indicators. In the global context, the idea that we should be both m measuring and aiming for economic, social and environmental goals simultaneously, a kind of triple bottom line, has become more and more a worldwide accepted idea. Says, guess who, Jeffrey Sachs. Um, now, I've mentioned him umpteen times before. Because that's the guy, too, who's the, who's, uh, he's not Catholic by any means at all. Uh, Mr. Sachs, and he's also one of the, the hubs, you might say, for the whole UN sustainability thing through all the universities to make sure they're all on board with the same indoctrinations across the US especially, but in the world as well. Quite something, eh? And he's based at Columbia University, and he's an economist again, and UN's a good advisor. So he's an advisor at the UN on, on sustainability, and an advisor at the, this Pope as well. And I'll put all the links up on him too uh, that I've given before. And it says, uh, he's been closely involved in the goals and heads at uh, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. That's even though, as Sachs points out, here in the US we barely discuss or acknowledge the goals. That's because the public are not supposed to really know about it. <laughs> anyway, it says, when it comes to sticking that triple bottom line, uh, not all countries are faring very well at the moment. That's the, the gist of a new report from Bertelsmann uh, Stiftung, uh, a large German foundation, another foundation, of course, and Sachs Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Uh, what, do you get to vote for that? Too? No, we don't. No. We just actually write the countries of the world based on where they stand at the outset of trying to achieve these goals over the next decade and a half. This reminds me, actually, of the racket, the same, a lot of the same characters, actually, you know, who are into this international thing through various movements, including trying, almost pretending they're going to have world wars starting, etc., during the Cold War. And, and the whole racket uh, of the big corporations are just churning out missiles and anti-missile missiles, and all we need a new bunch of missiles and anti-missile missiles because the, your enemy over the road there has got some uh, better ones than yours that go, goes half a mile faster an hour, and all that rubbish. I mean, it was a great, great, a fantastic thing to churn out these missiles, you know. 
billions and billions every year. Oh, and, and, and our tax money was getting thrown at them all the time. And this is very similar. They try to get it, you almost into a sort of race. We're all racing against, oh, let's get, let's get our country labeled up as the highest givers right now, too. This, like, it's all some kind of, I'm not, are you in some kind of Olympics thing or something? I'm not, are you, are you? Did, did you put your name down for some, some participation in a race to, 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 to do all this? And, and did you? No. Do you understand the psychology behind all this? Right? Who is trying to base and where do they stand at the outset of trying to achieve the goals over the next decade and a half? Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Huh. So it goes on to say in this article, what we've done in this report is the first scan of about 150 countries, Sachs said. The first time anybody has taken a look across the world, 193 UN member countries endorsed the Sustainable Development Goals, but there wasn't enough data to include all of them at this point. Based on the data available, though, the report finds that Scandinavian countries, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland, win the honour of Sweden, was already 84.5% of the way to the best possible outcomes across the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. The report found ranking number one in the world and receiving a corresponding score of 84.5. Isn't this, 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 this like some big Olympics game, folks? To get your name up there. Oh, oh you, you, so-and-so's next. And so, so-and-so did terribly bad. Oh, it's bad, bad. Eh? I mean, if you're guilty. These are private foundations and organizations that are shaping the whole planet for the big capstone on the top of the pyramid. Hmm. Understand? I hope you do. But of course, there's no mention of that here. It's all, almost like it's all, this one to get you into the same kind of thing uh, that they do with politics. Oh, you know, someone says out in the lead, someone, oh, they're running by a, a whole length. Blah, blah, blah. It's just like sports. That's what they, how they use it. And you know something? It works on a primitive level with an awful lot of people. Yeah. I'm just showing you how you're used and abused. This is child's play stuff. And none of it's got anything to do with you because you don't vote on anything. All it's meant to do is make you just pay you up and shut up. Yeah. As though it was normal. All oh, sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Really? How much does Mr. Sachs get from all of this, etc., etc.? And who are his big masters above him? Because he will have them. So you understand the techniques are always used, eh? It's like sports. Just like sports. Always winning by a, a, a whole length, blah, 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 blah. Here it's here. In fact, the U.S. scored in the red, meaning seriously far from achievement of 2015 for 12 out of 17 of sustainable development goals. These goals were no poverty, zero hunger, gender equality, affordable and clean energy. What's gender equality got to do with sustainable development? They don't have children. Decent work and economic growth, reduced inequalities, responsible consumption and production and climate action. Life below water, life on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions and partnerships for the goals, which involves establishment transnational collaborations to achieve them. These poor rankings were doled out because, amongst other things, the U.S. has too many people below the poverty line and too much adult obesity. Too little renewable energy, isn't that a judgment by an outsider? Too many homicides and people in prison, and so on and so on. The individual country level breakdowns can be read and then give you that there too to, to make you blush with shame if you're on them, if your countries are on them, you see. You're not winning, you're not winning like Sweden and all these other countries, you see. You should blush with shame for these private institutions <laughs> to rule your brain, eh? <laughs> now we're going to the next one to do with environment and so on. And racketeering, as far as I'm concerned, because I've never been a person to, 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 to fall for all the tricks out there, the simple tricks, like save money, get a, car, a card for this particular store or shop or whatever it happens to be. And uh, the government's doing the same thing, even with their, their beer stores or their liquor stores, you can get, they want to know, they can get a card, apparently, and they tally up your ear miles points, you see. And you can use the same card in, in some of these stores as well for air. Meanwhile, they're, they're getting all the data on what you're eating in the store, in the grocery stores. A, a, a complete list of everything you buy. And you don't, you don't mind that because you think it saves a few pennies. 
you're selling every bit of privacy out because you're, you're told is, it'll save you a few, or you might get ear miles, you know. The little mouse trap, as they call it in marketing. Get you in by, here's a bit of cheese. It's, people get what they deserve, don't they, eventually? They do, unfortunately. And the only way they're trying to sell the electric cars is by bribing the consumer to buy them, using taxpayers' money. And, and remember, too, like all big ventures, the company that owns them and the companies that own them, these electric cars, I'll be getting massive grants from the government. They already are to build them. Not bad for private businesses, eh? That's how these big guys, these guys become multi-billionaires. It's all by your tax money that they use. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it says cash rebates, tax incentives may help get Canadians into electric cars. And this thing called green car reports. Says there were all, just over 20,000 plug in electric cars in Canada's roadways as of May this year. And I bet you most of them, by the way, I bet you most of them are, are bought by provincial governments using your tax money for their bureaucrats. I bet you anything. It's just representing fewer than one third of 1% of all vehicles sold in the country. Cash rebates and tax incentives are the best way to convince Canadians to buy electric cars as part of an overall government strategy to cut greenhouse gas emissions. Federal officials conclude in a report and so on. However, those same officials have told Garneau that money set aside this year's budget to encourage people to take electric vehicles for a spin may be going to waste. The comments from the department's policy group are in response to a report by Electric Mobility Canada which made a number of recommendations in March to accelerate the deployment of electric vehicles across the country. They call them EVs. And Ontario, for instance, is spending $20 million of the taxpayers' money to get folk to buy these things. And believe you me, in the, in the rural areas, they're useless. They, 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 winter time, uh, they'll never hold a charge, you'll get a full charge into them, and they'll, never, they'll be flat before they've done a mile or two through heavy snow. But they're freezing. Freezing is death to big batteries. Anyway, it says the, the not-for-profit group's report called for, like, sure, who's really funding them? This, this green car stuff, eh? Um, it says the report called for purchase rebates of up to $3,000 per vehicle sold on top of provincial rebates, that's the government, local government, uh, amounting to a minimum of $3,000. So $6,000 rebates if you buy one of these things. Right? That's your, that's your bribe. The EV purchase incentives may hold the great... I guess maybe you can buy a lot of fire extinguishers with them too, because they're always going to fire. So it says, um, they likely hold the greatest uh, potential to increase the sales, just given bribing the public. Why don't they say bribing the public? Instead of calling incentives. Huh? As you address arguably the most... It, it shows you what they think of the public, the most important barrier to uptake. High cost premiums for EVs compared to conventional vehicles, it says. Uh, Transport Canada uh, said, uh, blah, blah. And it says, in documents obtained by Canadian Press, it says officials noted that at nearly all sales of electric vehicles in Canada, 95% were completed in provinces that offered EV purchase rebates. Applying a federal cash incentive in provinces where rebates already exist would not only spur new sales, blah, blah, blah. British Columbia, Ontario and Quebec currently offer incentives to buyers of so-called sub-emission vehicles. Do you know how much electricity it takes from where? Uh, nuclear power stations to charge these things? Do you think that, that putting up windmills is going to be enough once everybody's got these, these cars? Do you think so? Who's kidding who? They know this. But under Agenda 21 for the 21st century, you see you won't be driving for very long anyway. Step by step, they'll knock it out of your, your ability to drive. Because in Agenda 21, this is when they've got you in your sustainable living uh, communities, um, then it's essential vehicles only. No private vehicles allowed. So we police, fire, ambulance, and so on. Yep. So uh, that's one article there. And then you go into a little, I'll put up uh, the wiki page on Elon Musk. He's the guy who's got uh, one of the branches of uh, this building these cars. 
And again, you get the same thing, multi-billionaire. And he's, but when you go into various things he's been involved in, again, it's, 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 there's a lot of obviously public input of cash uh, from the governments uh, to, to, to how he, these guys make their money. Of course there is. Always. You know, <laughs> that's, how, that's how it works. And also, this one here, this article about globalization. Uh, India says that the U.S. should move towards sustainable development. And that's by the, the, the envoy to the U.S. from India, Richard Verma, his name is. And he's, he's, he's emphasizing on the need to forge a strong partnership to achieve a more sustainable development. Uh, uh, so it says the U.S. ambassador to, in, uh, to India, Richard Verma. And uh, they go on, it says, the challenge is clear for all of us to pioneer a path towards a more sustainable future. It's funny how that always ends up meaning the taxpayers to fund other countries. More and more and more and more and more cash, isn't it? What a great way to rip everybody, make everybody poor and to make a few folk stinking rich. Because money never goes to the countries they're talking about, as you well know. It's all a racket. It's always been a racket. Most of the history of the world's been a racket, you know. When you really look at it. So Verma says, without electricity, it's simply impossible to create the necessary jobs, homes and factories. Well, well, guess what? I mean, if they're cutting out all the different power plants and so on, carbon uh, power plants uh, in North America, we're already been going to be short of electricity. Uh, and we're supposed to put, turn into a third world country so we can, and at the same time fund countries across the world to get more electricity themselves while well, you have less. It's all madness, you see. It says, um, so this, this particular delegate says he was of the, the view that through this growth it will lift India's hundreds of millions of people into the middle class. Well, the middle class in the US and Britain and everywhere else has been plummeting for years since all the jobs went off to China. By the same globalists and with the same globalist agenda. Hmm? It's amazing how they create the topics that we've all, we've all to think about, we've all to give up all rights uh, for, and we have no right and say in, in, in any of them. They're created by these characters. They create the terminology to be used, everything else. Hmm? So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all a done deal, this kind of stuff, as long as we allow it to be a done deal, isn't it? And then sustainable development, it says a new kind of globalization. Around the world, people are calling for a new kind of globalization. The current version, once called the Washington Consensus, has delivered economic growth, but at enormous costs, rising inequalities of income, massive environmental destruction and growing lawlessness. The search is on for a new approach, sometimes called sustainable development, to ensure that economic growth is also socially just and environmentally sustainable. This is the racketeering of the nonsense of the way they dress up our big, big racket in a con game. Yep. Nine months ago, Pope Francis spoke to world leaders of the UN calling for such holistic and moral vision, and the world leaders responded by adopting a new framework of cooperation for the years 2016 to 2030, called Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. The aim is not global governance, but global decency. What? Have you, uh, uh, the people who run the entire system of globalization have brought you anything but decency, folks. Have you noticed? Your, your, your nations are crumbling, crumbling, as you're getting plundered and plundered and plundered. And it's all dressed up that you, that to make you feel guilty that you have not done enough, you're not giving enough, you're living too well as you scrape by, as prices go up and up and up, even for the basic necessities. And the, and these masters of guilt may try to make you feel guilt again about, it's, your, it's all your fault, the world's poor. It's your fault? Really? Your fault? Really? I was astonished when I went to the U.S. the first time and I saw how working class folk lived. And they lived in the little houses, and I mean little, that were built during mining days and so on. And 
they were small, they were not expensively built, but they were so proud of owning them compared to Britain, where at that time in Britain, most folk before Thatcher privatised all the all the, um, the council housing, for, put them up for sale, basically. Uh, houses that your grand, grand folks had already paid for through their taxes. Uh, they were really no bigger than those houses. And the, the folk were in, the working classes were generally and often no better off themselves. You know, but they were so proud, and the technique is to make people really, really proud, uh, and use their decency, their common decency, as you plunder them. You see, by training them to feel guilty about other nations and so on. Do you know that most countries across Africa, uh, when you really look into the nitty gritty behind all the nonsense that you're constantly fed, to sway your opinions and create opinions in you. Look behind it all. The ones that, that, that can hardly feed themselves, it's not, it's not because they're, they're, so, poor. they're so poor because the constant wars, often with, with, with Western countries, causing the wars, and the young guys are scared off the land, or they're off fighting in the wars, and there's no one left to literally look after fields and plant. That's because of starvation. There's many reasons for what happens, and generally it's not for the ones that they're telling you has got their hand, it's the big boys have got their hands out for cash, 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 cash. It never gets there. You've seen all the scams through the big agencies over the years for disaster reliefs. And all. Their racketeering is incredible. With top faces involved in it, you know, like Bill Clinton and even Bush Sr. together, with the millions getting thrown at them for Haiti, money that never got there. We see it over and over and over in our lifetime. And yet, the big con artists at the top of this whole world agenda, globalism, the, the big gangsters tell you to feel guilty about things or they tell you you're too fat as to give you junk to eat. Junk. Poisoned junk. And, and, and then they train your children at school to feel guilty. You see? And, and they've got built-in trigger, Pavlovian trigger responses to things. So that when the right things are said to them, they automatically go into the guilt mode. Oh, here, take everything, take everything for, for the next appeal for whatever it happens to be. As you get plundered and plundered and plundered. It's astonishing to me. It really is. And it's very, very sad, isn't it? As it happens over and over, your whole darn life long. And you watch it all, plus you remember it all too. That's quite something. Now, all these links I'll put up tonight for you to, to look at. And uh, it, it really is something else. It, it truly is. However, everything you read pretty well in the media now is, is marketed racketeering. Put out panels of experts get the, the story. They get all the little terms together that you're going to hear through repetition. Stuck inside the story to make to trigger you into the right kind of mood to get brainwashed and so on and so on. It all works to get this is all science, folks. Science. Remember, I read the report years ago from the military: the mind has no firewall. Be, be very, very careful what you let into it, folks. Because so much stuff under the guise of truth is nothing more than social and personal indoctrination for you, just made for you. That's what it is. Your mind is not your own. And once that happens, well, from Hamish myself from Ontario, Canada, who is still pouring rain, it's good night. I mean, your God or your gods go with you.